Um, Humphrey, uh, we were originally meant to meet um, a few months ago when uh, you were awarded the Bonapol Prize for the second time. Um, but you were unfortunately unable to make it because of the revolution that was taking place. Uh, there was a park tank right outside your building, I was told. Um, email communications were cut off. Um, um, yes, yeah, that's true. You were, of, you were pretty much isolated, really, weren't you? I was during that period, though it's a funny word to use when one is in the middle of a maelstrom. But first, first of all, I'd like it to make it absolutely clear that well, I didn't leave because I couldn't. Mm -hmm. I could perfectly well, I could perfectly well have gone to the airport mm -hmm. and got on the plane I was supposed to get on, mm -hmm. but um, I didn't leave because I didn't want to. Yeah. Um, there was this is not an event that you, having lived in Egypt for thirty years or more than thirty years, that one could mm -hmm. possibly. Uh, yeah. want not to witness mm -hmm. um, so I stayed because I I couldn't leave in the sense that I couldn't pull myself away yeah. you know yeah. uh, and then that tank yes well the tank was there um, my apartment is um, 50 yards or so from the Ministry of the Interior mm -hmm. um, and that tank represented for me and for everybody else uh, in my neighborhood, I think um, at that moment it represented um, stability and peace of mind because there had been a couple of nights of quite um, heavy firing with live ammunition, ammunition and so on, right mm -hmm. underneath our balconies, um, where, when the sort of last stand of the um, of the riot police yeah. uh, and at the Ministry of the Interior, all this taking place kind of off stage as far as the world media was concerned because they and it was slightly irritating to, to be watching all these TV channels who had their cameras so consistently glued on Tahrir Square right. which obviously was the center of things but there were a lot of other things going on around the periphery yeah. which never got recorded um, but after those two days of um, mayhem uh, right in our neighborhood uh, then there was a moment of eerie peace mm -hmm. for an hour and a half when we all descended into the street yeah. and sort of started wondering why we hadn't fixed those iron doors to the apartments mm -hmm. for the last 30 years, you know, um, and kind of making up a dad's army of people with whatever sticks they could find yeah. and stuff. Um, because there, were, there was a lot of talk of uh, looting mm -hmm. and um, thugs being yeah. on, on, the, on the loose. And then the army came and everybody relaxed and it was yeah. like, okay, now that we know that there's not going to be Relax. anything immediate, yeah. you know, in this okay. immediate neighborhood. So um, they, they represented, um, uh, they were met with a sigh of relief. Yeah, mm. yeah. Things um, may have changed in the way that people view the army now, mm -hmm. but that was the situation then. Yeah. Mm. And how many of, what did you think of the representation of the um, of the events uh, in terms of the media, both local and foreign. I suppose were, were there the uh, were foreign media outlets available? Um, well, it, it was patchy because, yeah. um, as you know, uh, Gazira Arabi mm -hmm. was banned. It was not available yes. um, uh, for pretty much the duration. Mm. And the same, I th uh, for, it seemed to be. Um, I, I can't. I couldn't work out the exact technical. Um, reasons for this, but I, I could never get um, BBC Arabic either. Mm -hmm. So, actually, my Arabic uh, um, uh, language media mm -hmm. access was was reasonably limited. Well, I, I mostly watched um, uh, Al Jazeera English, mm -hmm. and though I think that they did, uh, I mean, they were on the same side of the angels. I mean, yeah. they were also. They seem to be so overcome by the straight by the by the with excitement mm -hmm. that the commentator ran out of adjectives to describe it within the first ten <laughs> minutes. I mean, after he'd said unprecedented, amazing, astounding, yeah. you know, for ten minutes, they were kind of stuck as to how to that's how to de right. deal with the um, uh, issue uh, thereafter. I mean, that said, um, you got a good picture, but as I say, it was only the picture from Tahrir and then occasional feeds from. From out from other places that were very hot, like um, Suez and and Alexandria mm -hmm. uh, and and so on. Yeah. Um, but when they were talking about, for example, there was talk of um, uh, 
thugs, um, gangs of people beating up mm. uh, people who are trying to reach the square yeah. to participate, take part in the in the protests. Um, we never, I mean, I never saw a journalist go out and actually try and find those or film those. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was maybe the insurance policies of the media don't allow that anymore. I don't know. But in the old days, I think people used to do that. Mm. And how long have you lived in Cairo? Um, more than 30 years. Um, not all in one go, obviously. So whenever I try and work it out with a paper and pencil, I, I find it very difficult to actually put all the bits together. But it's certainly well over 30 years now. Mm. So obviously, we've seen the um, such this dramatic outburst. Uh, how have things been changing in the past few months? Uh, there have what been upsurges. Thing, I suppose. Yeah, there have been. It, it was from the beginning very much a pendulum sort of thing. If you mm -hmm. take it from the standpoint of the the progressive forces mm -hmm. that um, initi initiated yeah. protests. Um, I think there were moments of great elation followed by moments of great despair, um, especially in the, at the beginning, but then a more sort of long-term, um, a, a feeling that there's always a danger that uh, after the first excitement and the first um, successes, mm -hmm. there's always the danger of things mm -hmm. slipping back mm -hmm. and um, of forces that are not responsive to people's demands um, reasserting themselves and at the moment I think people are waiting basically for the elections to mm -hmm. see what happens um, there's uh, a process by which um, people are trying to form parties mm -hmm. uh, in a scramble because yeah. I mean how, f how it takes a while mm -hmm. to form a party and to discover your Absolutely. constituency and to define your policies and mm -hmm. so on and all this has to be done by September which is a very mm -hmm. very big task indeed Absolutely. so now I would say there's sort of on the side of the people who initiated there's there, there is is hope but also some apprehension mm. now on the, on the sort of swinging things back to the literary side mm. um, what effect do you see this um, this uprising having on sort of the not only I would say the at literature itself being written but on the reception it's likely to have in the West, how do you see people sort of more willing to um, finance translations, to um, devote time to works they wouldn't have devoted time to, say, five, ten years ago? Well, I think that it already happened um, starting, starting with 9 11 in a way, but even actually, if you push it back. 9-11 itself was like a critical turning point mm -hmm. uh, in, in, the, in the moment at which perhaps the West as a whole, whatever that means, sort of woke up to the fact that they, were, they wanted to know, understand better mm -hmm. what happens in the yeah. Arab world and that literature is a route to doing that. Um, uh, but, um, but I mean, it's a situation that's been building up over over decades and yeah. it perhaps it probably goes back to Dawson's Field. I mean, the, mm -hmm. this... this yeah. The, this region has just been in people's faces on the media mm -hmm. um, for a very long time um, and and it took perhaps a surprisingly long time for publishers mm -hmm. to to take a risk um, in, in uh, translating and, and publishing literature uh, maybe um, maybe uh, also a crossover success like the Akubian mm -hmm. building mm -hmm. helped to establish, especially in publishers' minds, yeah. the fact that you could have a viable book yes. come out of the Middle East and, yeah. and, and translated yeah. from Here's from something Arabic. foreign and it's commercially viable. We can right. make money. Right. 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 I mean, I don't mean all publishers right. think yeah. that way, okay. but that it it did kind of break a certain mm. barrier more yeah. generally. And and since then, um, as a translator, um, to be I suppose slightly mercenary about it. I'm, I, f I feel very lucky because mm -hmm. there is much more demand, yeah. um, uh, and I'm never at a loss for people wanting to translate books. Yeah. Now, whether whether that has been given a further boost by the revolution, I'm not completely sure. It it could well be. It could well be. Yeah. Mm. Mm. But I guess, I guess uh, it's when someone tries to think of Arabic literature in English translation. Uh, you think back, I mean, I, I was three years old, I think, when 
Mahfouz won the Nobel Prize. And before then, I think the, there are very few houses that were doing any literature in translation. I think Free Continents Press was one of the few, mm. the rare exceptions, mm. you know, mm. without these um, colorful little paperbacks they used to do. Um, and they had a, a very interesting list. But I think back then, you had Dennis Johnson Davies, and he was mm. the, the, the Dwyer by default, really, because there wasn't really anyone else. Mm. Uh, mm. This is not obviously to disparage his translation, he's done some very good work indeed. But um, now, even though a lot of people be saying that you've replaced him now, that you've become the leading translator, uh, but the situation has changed dramatically in that you have competition now. There are a lot of people getting into it, whether right. they're, they're, um, they're Westerners, whether they're Arabs themselves. Um, so there, is, there has been this proliferation mm. as well. Um, That's fine. Was, I mean, basically, yeah. you know, there, yeah. there's room. Yeah, no, of course. <laughs> it all room. comes down yeah. to if we're going to rely on one translator or two translators, then yeah. a lot of literature isn't going to get uh, translated, and uh, and the readership will be at the mercy of a, a very limited yeah. range of capabilities. Yeah, and you're you're entering the um, the second decade of your activities as a translator, aren't you? Um, uh, just short of a decade yeah. now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. I, th I think my first translation was published in in two thousand and three. Mm. Yeah. Right, okay. yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, what projects have you enjoyed working on the most? Um, well, it, well it's, it's, it's a long it's time very to cover, but yeah. Difficult mm. to choo pick and choose. I haven't trans, I've maybe only translated one book mm. that I, at the end of the day, really thought, well, I didn't, I, during, during which I lost respect for the book rather than gained it, yeah. you know? Mm. Um, and I'm not going to mention what that no? book was. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Other than that, um, every book has been in some way rewarding. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, Elias Khoury, whom I've now done three, three, uh, who, three of whose novels I've yeah, now translated, right. has been immensely gratifying. I mean, mm -hmm. I, he's a writer whom I admire enormously mm -hmm. and therefore get an, a great deal out of translating him. But there are other writers mm -hmm. whom I've also immensely enjoyed and I think are rather unfairly overlooked. I mean, mm -hmm. I think of, for example, Mohamed Mustagheb, mm -hmm. um, a writer who's uh, now dead as of a few years, an Egyptian, um, mm -hmm. with a, very, a, a sort of almost like a sort of upper Egyptian Baroque yeah. kind of uh, view of the world. Mm -hmm. um, very, uh, very imaginative and very... Yeah. Uh, um, intelligent in his writing, mm -hmm. and many others, many yeah. others. And Matt, this is the second title that uh, the Macros um, has just published um, from Khouri's. The first one was Yellow. Yes. Um, what was the most sort of surprising difference in translating these two very, very different books? Um, so you have Yellow, 2009, um, as though she were sleeping, just published this month. Mm -hmm. um, what did you see as the most striking difference between the two? Well, Yellow though it might seem odd to describe it as being linear, is actually mm. somewhat more linear in its, mm -hmm. in its construction mm -hmm. than As Though She Was Sleeping, which one of, must be one of the least linear yeah. narratives that's been, ever been put on paper. Um, uh, but um, I tend to think more in terms of the, of the similarities. I mean, I'm intrigued in both of them by the um, entry into... In a, a Christian imaginative, a mm -hmm. Christian Arabic, mm -hmm. and Yalo's case also, one would have to say Syriac mm -hmm. um, imaginative world, yeah. um, which is in, in, intensely realized. And that's interesting for two things. One, because it, it contains enormous beauties, mm -hmm. as revealed by Elias Khoury. But, but also, I suppose to some degree, simply because um, Christianity in the Middle East um, hasn't perhaps its importance mm -hmm. in the historical, historically in the Middle East and its contribution to, to, to Middle Eastern society has not perhaps been completely un understood. Mm 